Welcome everybody to our 93rd Reading Online Sport Economics Seminar. Uh, it's really good that we've got Arno uh, Chevalier today. We were hoped to have him uh, before Christmas, but uh, Arno was hit by COVID, and obviously we only meet because of uh, COVID. Uh, so it's uh, it's uh, in some respects it was it's good to certainly good to have uh, Arno now. Anyway, better late than never. Uh, before we get going, uh, administrative notices to uh, uh, to make. One of the most important and most imminent one is that Rod Fort, hugely well uh, known within the sports economics literature for many uh, hugely uh, significant contributions, uh, he is having a farewell symposium. Uh, it's the Dr. Rodney Fort farewell symposium. It's tomorrow. Uh, it's via Zoom. Uh, it's with, with a farewell lecture uh, at. Um, 4 p.m., which will be 4 p.m. Uh, guess Eastern time. Stefan will probably nod or, uh, or shake his head. Uh, what I will do is I've got a poster for the event that Stefan shared with me, and I will put that in the chat with the details. So it's the Rod Fort Farewell Symposium, which will be tomorrow uh, on Zoom. So everyone uh, interested in that, there'll be uh, a collection of his uh, PhD students, former PhD students and uh, colleagues uh, along the way, uh, as well as his lectures. So do uh, make a note of that tomorrow. It might provide uh, a nice distraction from other uh, footballing events uh, for uh, for many of us. Um, so that's that. Uh, on Sunday is the deadline for abstracts for the uh, 16th Gijón Sport Economics Conference uh, in uh, in memory of Stefan Kassen. So uh, please also uh, look out for that and do submit an abstract if you have one. Again, I'll put details in the chat. Um, but I'm not going to hold up Arno any longer. Uh, Arno, please do take away your talk on the dynamics of racial discrimination in a virtual labour market. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, rescheduling and having me today. I've managed to uh, use uh, the last, the few additional weeks to, to do a few more results. Uh, but despite that, uh, it's still preliminary. So there's still some uh, some stuff that needs to be done and probably some uh, explanations that needs to be uh, perfected. So I will be happy to have your your comments. So feel free to jump in whenever things are, are unclear. And, and you can squarely put the blame on myself because Alex has not even seen the, the most recent slides, uh, which I sent to him about half an hour ago. So uh, don't blame him. I, I will t I will take it all. <laughs> uh, so so what we are doing here, we are uh, we are going to look at uh, at a virtual labor market, and we are going to look at decisions to of people to hire uh, workers. And you, you can guess that it's going to be about uh, a sport event, so it's going to be about fantasy football, but let's, let's think about it more generally. Uh, so we are going to speak about a firm, so the participant in fantasy football league, uh, who are hiring workers, the football players uh, in the Premier League. And, uh, and we think there are quite a lot of advantages in that setup. One of them is going to be that it's, it's going to be dynamic. So the season lasts for 38 weeks, and therefore, we are going to observe the decision of the same people over 38 weeks as information about the productivity of, of the workers get revealed and get more precise. So that's kind of where the, the dynamic of racial discrimination is coming in. And, and we think we are kind of the first one to be able to do those things of looking at the, set, the decision of the same set of people over a period of time as more information is revealed. And now my presentation freezes. <laughs> Sorry, let's go back. Yeah, no, it works. Um, so, so yeah, there's been there's a there's a huge literature on on, uh, on discrimination, uh, and basically, uh, the historical background is yeah from the 60s there's legislation that has prevented uh, racial discrimination in employment in the U.S. In the U.K., it was a few years later. So basically, over the last for uh, 60, 70 years now, there's been a huge amount of work that has been done by labor economists on racial discrimination in labor markets. So what can we add to that? So I've already hinted a, a little bit, but before, before we, I explain more what we are doing, I'm going to do a, a quick review of, uh, of what we kind of know. So kind of the bulk of, uh, of studies nowadays is kind of correspondence studies. So there's, there's a famous paper, the most famous paper by Bertrand and Mulanathan, where basically they, they respond to real job ads with uh, fake CVs that differ in one criteria. So here in, in, their, in their paper, it was a race. 
Uh, and then they send both CVs to the employer and count the number of callbacks that they get. Uh, and from that, they got that uh, CVs with a white sounding name receive 50% more callbacks than CVs with a black sounding name. Okay, so that hinted at some discrimination, at least at the first stage of the hiring process uh, for employers in the US. And that kind of setup has been replicated uh, throughout the world uh, with lots of variations. And if you're interested in that, you can just check the, uh, the website of uh, Steinbert, um, who has a, a repository of all the studies that he knows of uh, that are using correspondence studies. So it, it's super interesting if you, uh, if, you, if you want to have a view or a look at that literature, somebody has managed to put it all together in one place. Um, and then maybe for kind of the depressing news is that paper that basically does correspondence studies type of uh, and compare what has happened in the UK over 50 years. And they basically they find no change in the in the callback or the difference in callback between white and blacks. So despite increased legislation, um, more and more awareness about uh, racial issues it doesn't seem that employers have changed their behavior much. Um, and then one paper that I like a lot uh, is a paper by Bartosz and co-authors, where uh, they not only do those kind of, of correspondence studies, but also have a, a software that allows them to track how much effort do the employers spend at looking at the information provided in the CV of the, of the uh, applicants. Uh, and what they find is that employers spend more time reading the, the CVs of white applicants compared to the CV of, uh, sorry, minorities versus non-minorities. In their case, it was not not white. So whether it's because of taste or because of unconscious discrimination is, is unclear, but I think that that kind of uh, differences in how much effort employers put into processing information is very interesting. And, and maybe we, we can come back to, to that a little bit in our setup. So, so the limits of the correspondence studies is that basically it's only an intermediate step in the hiring process. So it's only the first stage. Do you get a callback or not? But in some sense, it's not the, the, the outcome of interest. We will be interested in whether people are hired and at what wage they are hired. And, and the other difficulties or limit is that it, it struggles to explain why employers discriminate. So what we are going to do in, in that paper is to try to, um, to answer some of those uh, questions or so to, to tackle some of those limits. So we are going to be uh, in, a, in a fictional world. So there is no legislation here that prevents anti-discrimination. So people are going to be able to behave as they would like. So if they have the taste for discrimination, they are going to be able to express it, which is typically not uh, doable in, uh, in uh, an observational studies because employers will know that they are not allowed to discriminate. So they, they may refrain from expressing their taste. So here we are, we are going to be able to potentially observe whether people have, have a taste for discrimination because it's not unlawful. Um, the other thing that is very different compared to other type of studies is that here the uh, productivity of workers is going to be observed and it's going to be observed for the applicants, for all applicants to, to the job. So all the, all the workers that the firm is going to consider are going to have their productivity measured. Um, so the other advantage that we have is that the production process of the firm is known which is also very unusual. And not only it's known, but it's going to be the same, the same for all firms. And the other thing that we can control for in our setup is the customer preferences. So we know that potentially some of the behaviors that is observed is not because the employers want to discriminate, is, is because their customers are discriminating. Uh, so there is some evidence of that, those famous papers using baseball cards and the price of uh, different baseball cards with players that are either white or black. Uh, there is also the paper by uh, Leeds and Rockoff on the odds of um, horses, depending on whether the jockey that is mounting them is black or white. Uh, and those things tend to, uh, to show that there is some customer preferences, sorry, some customers have some biases uh, in their preferences and are happy to pay more for uh, having uh, a the card of a white baseball card player or having a white jockey on a horse. 
Um, so the other thing on which we don't know much, as I said uh, at the beginning, is how discrimination evolves over time. And we are going to be able to speak over that since we are going to observe 38 period of decisions regarding um, uh, hiring decisions. Uh, and then something that we can do, but we're probably not going to have time to speak about today, is we can look at the impact of competition on the discriminatory behavior. So if you're thinking of kind of, uh, no, I will come back to, to it later in a little bit if we have time. So let's, let's leave it at that for the moment. So that's all the things that we can potentially do in, in, in the setup that we have that, is that are typically not possible in the, in the rest of the literature or that are limited in the rest of the literature. So what is our setup? As I highlighted earlier, basically we are going to have a, build a, an employer employee database where our employer are going to be participants in fantasy football league. And the employees are going to be the footballer in uh, the English Premier League. And, and the game is such that each participant needs to hire some uh, footballers on a weekly basis. Uh, and as I said earlier, discrimination is not unlawful. Uh, productivity is going to be observed for all the footballers in your team, but also all the other footballers that you don't have hired yet, uh, but that you could consider hiring. The other thing that is different from the kind of uh, the natural world, uh, but is, uh, is also, also helpful for us, is that wages are set exogenously. So here, the firm is a wage taker, and if you want to hire a given worker, you have to pay a wage that is being set exogenously. So you cannot bargain with, uh, with the workers to, to lower their price in order to hire them. And uh, so in that setup also, the, the production function of the firm is going to be identical. So all the firms are going to produce the same product, which are fantasy football points, uh, and those products, that product is, is, uh, is produced exactly the same for all the firms. Um, the other thing that is going to be of importance for us in trying to explain um, the behavior of, um, of, the, of the participants is that there, there is no interaction between workers. So in the real world, employers may be concerned that their workers may be biased and don't want to interact with workers of another type, uh, and that affects their decisions to whom to hire. So here, basically, that's not going to be the case because you're only hiring workers virtually, so it doesn't matter uh, to the worker who is the other worker is. And, and the other thing why it's important is there's going to be no productivity spillovers. So the productivity of one work, sorry, the overall productivity of the firm is going to be purely additive in the productivity of each worker. There is no complementarities between workers. Um, as we said earlier, there is also in the real world, the potential that customers are discriminating. But here, basically, there is no customers to source firms. So there is no customer discrimination. And, and workers are not going to be able to source themselves between firms that discriminate and firms that do not discriminate or out of the labor market. So basically here, we think that the only source of discrimination that is going to remain is a test for discrimination, as, as explained by, by Baker in his 90, original 57 article. And, and as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, what we are going to observe is the hiring decisions, but also the firing decision, which is something that we usually know very little in, in the literature. And we are going to have some kind of promotion decision uh, in the sense that in the fantasy football, you, one of your worker is going to have its productivity doubled. So it's basically, it's the worker that you think is the most productive that you want to name as your, as your captain. So you see, we see that as a promotion prospect. And we are going to observe all of those decisions, hiring, firing, and, and promotion over a 38 period. Okay. So I can say a, little, a few things more about Fantasy Premier League to, to set the scene. So basically, it's, it's an online game. Uh, it's free to participate. And in the year for which we have the data, there is three and a half million participants. And even so, the league is based on the uh, English Premier League. Um, the participants are from all around the world. Okay. Um, 
you don't need to be a, a computing wizard or a video game wizard to play the game. All you have to do is make decisions about hiring and firing people. So you don't really have to do anything else but make those decisions. Uh, so the, the participant is basically, basically the owner of the club, uh, of a virtual club, and he gets a budget of 100 millions to, to buy 15 players. And those players are real football players that play in the English Premier League in the season that we observe. Okay, and the decision is to buy those players, sell them, uh, and then conditional on having bought them, whether you, those players are going to count for the production of your firms or whether they are just going to be sitting on the bench. Okay, so only 11 of your 15 players actually count for the production of your firm, and the other four are just there as substitutes. So that's basically the only decision that the participants have to make. Those decisions have to be made on a weekly basis because games are, are basically organized uh, on, a, on a weekly basis uh, in, the, in the fantasy, in, sorry, in the real league. Um, and um, so some specific about the, the Premier League. After your initial decision, you're, you're not bound to have that uh, team for the rest of the season. So you can, every week you can revise your team. So you can get rid of some players and you can pick some new ones. The first transfer that you do is free. Any subsequent transfer costs you four points. So since the production that, you, that you're making in that firm is Fantasy Football League, basically the cost is that you lose some production. As I said earlier, the, the prices of the footballer are, are generated exogenously. So uh, let's not go back to that. Um, and maybe compared to some to other uh, fantasy leagues that do exist around the world, one of the difference here is that several players can own, sorry, several participants can own the same player. So there is no limit on how often a given footballer can be bought by participants. And for us, that's very uh, crucial because that means that there is no uh, strategic hiring that takes place. So you, you don't pick up somebody just because you don't want one of your opponent to have that player. You, you pick up somebody because you really want to have that player. OK, so there is no strategy. Uh, there is some strategy in hiring, but you don't hire somebody just to uh, prevent uh, one of your competitors to, to get that worker. Um, so now let's move into the to the production. So the, basically, depending on the performance on the pitch, the produce the, the footballers are producing fantasy football points. Uh, so they are going to, as I said earlier, going to be purely additive to, to the firm. And the only objective of the firm is to maximize the number of points that is produced. Okay, so that's that's the setup. Um, and there's some measures of competition. So as I said, you're, there's three and a half million participants. So the the winner of the among the three and a half million is going to win some prize. Uh, but that may not be a great motivation because uh, I guess most people realize quickly that they are not going to be the winner. Uh, but maybe the, the other type of competition that exists within the Fantasy Premier League is that you can also compete among your friends. So you can set up a local league of your friends and then you only compete against your friends. Okay, and we think that that's probably the, the thing that keep people more interested. Uh, so basically, here the, the incentive is the, brag the bragging rights that you can claim for beating your friends at fantasy football. Okay, and, uh, and I'm not going to reveal uh, the competition that I have with Alex in our uh, local league. At least not virtually, but if we were, if we were having a pint later on, then maybe I will, I will spill the beans. Okay, so... While all of that sounds great, there is also some disadvantages of the Fantasy Premier League. So you could say that the stakes are very low. Okay, uh, we may caring about we may care about the bragging rights, but some people may not. So the, the stakes are low. But in some sense, the stakes in the, in the lab experiment, which is also another way of where uh, people have been exploring uh, discrimination, stakes in lab experiments are also typically reasonably low. So it's it's not we are not the only one to to use low stake kind of uh, setup. Um, psychological, uh, oh, sorry, that's not what I wanted to say. Sorry, let's move to the, to the next point. Um, there is no physical interactions between the employer and the employee. 
Okay, so in the real world, we, we may think that employers do discriminate or may discriminate because they never want to interact with their uh, employees of the type that they do not like. Um, and uh, while well, we think that first, as soon as the firm is large enough, then the employer may not actually really off, often meet with those employees, so that may not even be such a concern in the real world. And, and even if there is no physical interaction, psychologists have shown that basically uh, your brain activity is triggered by meeting somebody from a group that you don't like, even just by having a picture of that person. So you don't need to actually meet a person of a group that you don't like for your brain to become active. You can, your brain will react just by looking at a picture of it. Um, and then the question is that, are those participants and their decisions similar to uh, what employers will make? So if we want to make the jump from fantasy football to uh, more generally the, the labor market, we, we should think that those people are like employers. So we think that their decisions are really pretty much like employers. However, their own characteristics may be quite different from employers. So that we don't have uh, we don't have so many characteristics. We have some. Um, so we have some information on race, gender, previous experience of the, of the fantasy league. What we don't have is age, which is probably the characteristics on which they differ the most. Okay. Um, but in some sense, we have a, a broad uh, cross section of of a population. Okay. So when you want to make a decision in the fantasy league, it's kind of the, the kind of uh, screen that you will face is that one. So over, sorry, I, I managed to make that, make that a little bit wrong. So, ah, what? okay, so over there here, you, you will have the name of, of the players um, and some information about their price, which is that column over there and their last performance, which is that number over there. Okay, and then if you, if you want to know more about a player, you click on it. So here it's uh, Romelu Lukaku, and, and you get more precise information about that player. Okay, so you know uh, how good he got those 13 points last week. Well, that's, that's how he, he, he got them. I'm not sure why it cuts, because when I, when I last checked my presentation, you could see more on the, on the right side. But here you will have some information about his performance in the, in the, last, uh, pre, in the previous weeks. Um, you have some, uh, you, you have the, the value of the player as well as how popular the person, the player is. Okay, so basically by clicking, you get more information about the productivity of the player, but also you get the picture happening. Okay, so here you, you see Romelu Lukaku uh, staring at you, more or less. Okay, why am I highlighting that? It's because we think that um, we are going to be able to measure race in different ways, thanks to the, the way the information is provided. So first, we have the name of the people, of the, of the footballers. So we can, uh, we can put those names in some softwares, which will give us a, a probability that a person with such a name is of a given race. Okay, so that's going to be a, a name-based measure of race, as has been used in the literature. Uh, but here in that setup, we also have a picture of the um, of the footballer, which is also going to be used to to give us some measures of the race of the individual. Okay. And in fact, we are we are going to use those pictures twice. Uh, one is going to be uh, based on some anthropomorphic measures. So basically, the distance between your eyes, the eyes on your nose, the eyes on your mouth, and various other things that I don't fully understand. Um, uh, and we are going to feed those pictures into a software which, based on those anthropic, anthropomorphic measures, is going to spit out a probability that the person is of a given race. And then maybe the kind of the way that most people perceive race is going to be based on skin color. So again, we are going to use those, those pictures and we, uh, we gave them to a bunch of uh, research assistants who have rated the skin color of those individuals. And we are going, also going to use the skin color as a measure of race. So we are going to have three measures of race, uh, as has can be used in the literature. And some of, some of it, we are going to compare how much of a difference it makes, whether you use one measure or the other. And um, I'm going to, to come back to, to those race issues uh, in, a, in a second. Any question on the on the setup so far? Oh, 
okay, then I will I will carry on. So basically, what what we have in in mind is uh, the Baker type of model because we think that all other form of discriminations are not possible in the setup that we have. So you cannot. You shouldn't be uh, doing statistical discrimination since you have complete information on the productivity of each individual worker. There is no point of relying on the workers group to infer its productivity. OK, and we said there is also no discrimination from uh, employer or sorry, from employees or from other uh, workers. So the only thing that we think is left is a test for discrimination. Uh, so maybe I should go a little bit faster about that. But basically, in such a world, the, the, the workers uh, of, the, of the discriminated type are going to receive less employment offers. Uh, the condi conditional on receiving an employment offer, they need to be of higher productivity. OK, so uh, an employer who is discriminating against black workers is only going to hire a black worker if, if that black worker is most productive than the white equivalent white worker that he could hire that, at that price. OK, so that's going to be important because it means that the, the marginal black workers that a team has should be more productive than the marginal white workers from that team. OK, and since we are going to look at decisions to hire and fire mostly one worker, I will show you that in a second. Um, it's, it's going to be really decision about marginal workers that we are interested in. And, and basically, the, the same argument holds for promotion. So the, the workers that you are going to, to promote to the captain status, uh, you also, if you're a discriminating type, you're also going to only promote uh, a black worker if he is more productive, more productive than a white worker. Something is going wrong. I cannot move it again. Uh, okay, so here are some uh, descriptive statistics that kind of support what the, the Baker model is uh, is telling us. So in the year of the fantasy football for which we have data, thirty percent of the footballers are non-white. So I'm going to basically put race. Even so, we have reasonably precise measures of race with more than two race <laughs> available, I'm going to collapse it to a binary world where there is white and non-white. Okay? So uh, there is 30% of non-white uh, footballers in that year. But if you look at the non-white that are in teams, uh, so in employment, that have been at least selected by, uh, by employers, there is only 22% of them. So, so teams are whiter than they, that they should be if they were picked randomly. Okay, that's kind of what I want to say. Um, if you look at the uh, workers that are fired at a given period, 26% of them, or tw almost 27% of them, are black. So blacks or non-whites are 22% of the workers, but 27% of the workers that are fired. So they are overly fired. And if you look at promotion, here it's the other way around. So blacks. 22% of workers are black, but only 17% of promoted workers are black. So they are underpromoted. OK, so as kind of predicted by the Baker model, in all of those margins, we also we observe differences in uh, the probability of, of event by, by racial status. And um, that table is a little bit complicated. <laughs> so let's let's spend some time to think about it. So, 11 players are going to accrue points for the firm. So I'm going to exclude the goalkeeper because in that year, I think there is only, from memory, there is only one non-white goalkeeper in the Premier League. Uh, so basically here, you don't really have a choice to discriminate or not to discriminate. You, you have almost but, uh, no choice. You have to pick a, a white goalkeeper. So I, I'm, I'm eliminating the, the goalkeeper. So I'm left with 10 decisions to make. Uh, about players. So uh, a team can be composed of basically a 10 white person and zero non-white up to, up to the other extreme where a team is composed is fully black. I'm not sure why it doesn't work here. OK, so here basically we move from zero black in the team to more and more black people in the team. My, my pen is just giving up today. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so that's the direction of travel. So the teams are getting blacker as you move uh, downwards. Uh, and then in the in the next column, the uh, non-white player average productivity and and the least productive least productive non-white gives you uh, basically exactly that. So what is the average productivity of the non-white in a team with only one non-white player? Um, and you can see that the average productivity of non-white player is going down as more non-white players are in the team. OK, so that's also as you were expecting. The, the first non-white player that you hire has to be super productive for, for, for a discriminating person to hire him. Okay. Uh, and then the marginal black player that you hire, its productivity is also decreasing the more black players you have. Okay, and for white players, it's basically exactly the reverse. So the the the, the more non-whites you have in your team, the better, the most productive, it, the most productive, the, the remaining whites that you have in your team have to be. Okay, so that's kind of what we observe here. So while I showed you that table, I, I'm, I'm aware that I still haven't told you much about the data. So let's let's go to uh, that into. Uh, a little bit more detail. So we have uh, three, a bit more than 3 million participants for which we will know their weekly team selection, including basically uh, who is uh, counting for, for getting points, who is just staying on the bench, who is a captain, and there is a second person who is a vice captain. So it's basically your, should be your second most productive player. And we observe the productivity of everybody in your team and therefore the overall productivity. For the participants, we also know their history of playing the Fantasy uh, Premier League. So we can see that as the experience of the, uh, of the, of the employer. Uh, we have some measures of their interest in the game. So how many local leagues they have entered, uh, how large those leagues are. So that gives us some idea of, of competition and of interest in the game. Uh, and we know their country of origin. As, as, a, as the one that they put when they registered for, for the game. For a subsample of 100,000 of them, we also know their race and then gender, and that's basically based on their name. So as I was telling you earlier, um, basically with, uh, with name, you can, you can put those names into a software and it spits out um, a race in probability. So we've also done that with the employers, so with the participant, but only for a subset of them. So uh, and we did the same for gender. So again, with uh, with gen with uh, with a name, you can infer gender. Uh, so here is what it looks like. And among our more than three million participants, um, I'm going to split them between what I call the balance panel and the unbalanced panel. So the unbalanced panel is basically the people who missed the first week. So people who started playing the game but missed the first week. So in some sense, they, they may be less interested. Um, and, uh, and in fact, they, they do differ quite a lot compared to the rest of the participants. So the balance panel is people that we observe from week one onwards. Uh, and since you, once you've registered, you cannot, you cannot leave the game. Basically, if you start in week one, you're, you're de facto staying until the end. So you're de facto into a balance panel. OK, so we have uh, 2.2 million of participants that are in the balance panel. And uh, and my name sample uh, it started with 100,000, but we've lost some along the way, so we are left with 98,000. Okay, but what you can see is that the randomization works. So I randomly picked some people from the balance panel, and basically there is no differences in the characteristics of my name sample, which is going to be the one that I use the most for for the results that I'm going to present uh, compared to the full uh, sample of participants. So uh, if you are um, so maybe a few things of, of interest, so a bit more than half of the participants are UK based, another quarter are kind of the Western world, uh, uh, and then the remaining 25% are based all around the world, mostly in Asia. Um, the sample is of participant is uh, overly uh, male. So 87% of participants are male. And if you look at their uh, predicted race, there's also a kind of a, a nice split. So 
but two thirds of them are, are white and, and the remaining are split between Hispanic, Asians and black. OK, so that's our sample of participants. And as I said, I'm going to for a lot of the stuff that I'm going to present today, I'm going to look at the name participant at the name sample. Sorry. All right. So to solve the 3 million participants, we match them to the 670 professional footballers that are in the league, uh, for which we know their weekly productivity, uh, also their past productivity in previous seasons. As I said, we, uh, we know their race, uh, and uh, we know a few more things, like their age, nationality, international status that we picked from some other database. So it's not provided in the fantasy uh, Premier League, but it's easily available information. Uh, so if we look at the race, as I said, we, we can measure it uh, differently. We can measure it by that uh, anthropomorphic measures and by the name measure. Uh, <coughs> if you look at the, um, at the distribution, it's basically, what do I want to say here? Uh, so, uh, uh, right. So, about 400 of our footballers are classified as white according to their anthropomorphic uh, measures. Uh, it's only 350 if you look at the name measures. So the, the two things um, do not uh, do not the two different measures do not match perfectly, and, and maybe that also explains why in the literature there is also quite a bit of range of estimate of racial differences because people use different measures of race. Uh, and the other, so the other number that I present here is basically the uh, skin tone ranking uh, that we have. So basically, the white have a, so the skin tone ranking goes from one to seven, and basically our, our markers did a job that looks reasonable uh, in the sense that the the other or, or the AI measures does a reasonable thing. I'm not sure which way you should we should think about it, but at least the uh, the people who are classified as white on the AI measures are also found to have mostly uh, a whiter skin tone by our uh, uh, by our research assistant, uh, and people who are classified as black by the AI measures also are found to have uh, quite a bit a darker skin tone by our by our research assistant. And you find similar stuff when you use the name. Uh, so let's look at the correlations between all those measures, and maybe that's where it's, uh, things uh, are maybe at least to me were a little bit surprising. Is that basically a name measure of race is not that well correlated with the other two, so with the anthropomorphic and with the skin tone. So the name is is a little bit is quite a bit off, uh, and and now I create a fourth measure of of race. So that's bear with me <laughs> so my fourth measure of race is because basically i have no idea which one of those measures is the best one to use uh, and i could basically do the analysis for all three of them and and build some arguments but that's going to become cumbersome so today what i want to do is i want to present you most of the results with only one measure which is going to be what we call the unambiguous measure of race which is people who are classified either as white or non-white on all of those three measures okay so it's going to basically polarize our race measure. It's only keeping people who are on all measures classified as white or on all measures classified as black. OK, so that's what we are going to use. Let's keep those things, because otherwise I'm never managed to get to the results. Uh, so that's basically how productivity is measured for all of the uh, footballers. Uh, what I want to show you is, is those things. So, Substitutability between uh, black and white workers. Uh, so here is basically the amount of points that they score over the season. Uh, you can see the distribution for the black workers in the darker shade and for white workers in the gray. And you can see that they mostly overlap. So it's, it's not that one group is more productive, more productive than the other. They, they mostly overlap. Um, do they produce it differently? So if you look at productivity per minute played, basically it's the same. There is just a large amount of overlap uh, between black and white. Oops. Uh, distribution of price of uh, of the of the cost of those workers. So what I call price here, um, but it's basically the cost that you have to pay for hiring one of those workers. Again, there is there is a huge overlap between the, the black and the white workers. Okay, maybe there is a little bit of underpricing of of white players on the left-hand side. So the, 
it looks like there is some cheap white players around. But that, that yeah. Uh, but if you look at the number of points produced per cost, uh, then again, there is a very good overlap of the of the two distributions between black and white. OK, so from so, from those measures, we, we will conclude that uh, the workers are very close substitutes on average, OK, or over the full distribution. Uh, and that's what you find also if you do a, a regression of performance of a price, uh, basically the, uh, a dummy for race uh, is not significant there. So, but maybe there is some differences in how they produce that uh, that productivity. So, is, is there more variation in the productivity uh, for one group or the other? So, I don't know. Is one group more likely to be hit by injuries, or more likely to get red cards? In which case, you know, they are productive one week and very unproductive in the other one, or and so on. Okay. So, and maybe maybe uh, employers care about that. So they, so if we look at the standard deviation of the total amount of points produced over the season uh, by black and white, basically there is no variation. If we look at the standard deviation be divided by the total number of points, which is over there in the right corner, there is also no variation. So the, the two lines are almost always on top of each other. Uh, and if you look at the variation over the 38 period of the of the season. There is basically again no variations. I mean, uh, it it fluctuates a little bit more for the black workers than for the white workers. But look at the scale; it's uh, it's basically between 1.2 and 1.4. So the scale is also uh, very enlarged. And if you look at the confidence intervals, basically they always overlap. So on all those measures, we also don't find any differences in the variability of productivity of workers by race. Okay, and and maybe the last thing that we need to do before we we start doing the analysis is. Does the fund, at least if we want to have some kind of external validity, we should we should think whether the, the fantasy football league uh, operates like a labor market. OK, so the answer is that yes. So the, the, the greater the performance of a player in a given week, the more uh, uh, employers want to buy him the week after. And, and that's true for black and white. And there is a little bit of movement toward the end, but there is very, very few workers, uh, sorry, uh, footballers that score more than 15 points in a given week. So here, there's a, here it's a little bit more noisy. But for, for the bulk of the distribution, there's basically full overlap. It works exactly the same. Uh, and if you look at how much the demand, the demand changes the price, uh, again, uh, maybe unsurprisingly, since the price is, is done automatically by Fantasy Football League, there's also no difference by race here. So when there is greater demand, the price increase. So it does work like we would expect a, a labor market to work. So we are going now to split our analysis. How much time I've got left, in fact? I've got 15 minutes, no? That's... Yep, 15 minutes. All right. Uh, <laughs> um, we are going to split our analysis between the first week of the game, uh, because in some sense it's the most important one, is when you have complete free choice, you can pick 15 workers. Uh, and then in subsequent week, basically, you can change one worker for free, but any additional one is, is costly. Uh, so maybe your, your, the decisions are, are different. OK, so what we have to do is to create all the dyads of employers and uh, footballers. Uh, and that's where, uh, basically, we have, uh, we have far too many people in our database. So that's where I'm going to concentrate on the uh, named um, data, sorry, the, the name um, participants, the ones for which I've got name and race, so 100,000 of them. Uh, and I'm going to use the unambiguous race definition. And in week one, not all footballers are already there uh, because basically the league starts before the transfer window is over. So some foreign footballers are not available in week one, or even some local ones are not available in week one. So, we, and with that unambiguous race definition, we also lose some, uh, some uh, footballers. So we are left with 358. But that gives us basically a 35 million dyads. Okay, so a dyad is an, a participant and uh, any single one of the 358 footballers. So each participant is basically observed 358 times. Okay, so that's how we get to our 35 million observations. 
And then the decision here, M, is whether somebody is higher or not. So it's going to always going to be a zero one. It's always going to be a dummy, whether you're hired, whether you're the captain, whether you made it to the point paying position in the team. OK, and we are going to have a, a measure of whether the, the footballer is black. And we are going to uh, either have it on itself, or maybe the most interesting model is going to be interested, sorry, interacted with some characteristic of the footballer. So P is the footballer and F is the participant. So F stands for firm. OK, and we have some measures of the, of the participant. Oh, sorry, of the, of the player. Uh, so what are those measures? They are the position that that player plays in because that affects the points that you, that you get in a given week uh, for your performances, that the club that they belong to, that experience in the, in the Premier League, uh, and their international status. Um, we have some measures of performance in the first week of the season. It's whether or not you've played in the previous season in the Premier League. If you played, what were the total of points that you uh, that, that that footballer uh, got in the previous week and we know in the previous season? Sorry, and we normalize them, uh, and then we have a measure of the value of that footballer in that first week. Okay, so the price of that footballer. If you want to have that footballer in your team, how much you have to pay for it? Okay, so that's going to be our, our measures of interest. So, so the performance measures and value measures. We are going to, uh, since basically we, uh, we duplicate each participant 670 times, we are going to cluster at the participant level. Uh, and we can do that analysis by uh, the race of the participant, uh, the player's characteristics, or some participant's characteristics and the race definitions, okay? So we have tons of different variations that we can play with, uh, which is where I got a little bit lost. Um, so let's start with the initial decision or select a footballer for your team. So you have to pick 15 footballer out of the 351. If you don't put any control, so just a black dummy, you find that black players are slightly under likely to be picked. If you've put the basic set of controls, which are the position of the footballer, the club he plays with, his experience in the Premier League and international status, uh, you find that uh, there is a drop in uh, being picked, picked. So black players are less likely to be picked. And that's about 15% less likely at the, at, the mean, like at the mean of being picked. OK? So while the point estimates look very small, uh, the, uh, at the mean, that's still a 15% drop. And that's kind of similar to what the literature finds in uh, differential in hiring. It's, it's often around the, the 15, 20% less likely to be hired. And the type of control that they have are very crude. They are very similar to those kind of control. So then that, the thing that puzzled me is that when I started to introduce measures of performance, which is basically whether or not you were in the fantasy football last year and the points that you got last year, then we find some positive effect of being black. If you drop those measures and you put some measures of value, and you may think value should also reflect the performance, then again, we find that black players are discriminated. Um, and if you put all of, all of those measures together, uh, again, you find a positive discrimination of black. I put them together. Basically, those models are when you put the measures either separately by itself or by or also with an interaction with black, but it typically doesn't make much of a difference. OK, so that's why you always have two points on those things. OK, so here I got I got puzzled for, for a while. <laughs> while we were finding that uh, on some measures, uh, black were discriminated, but depending on the set of controls, black were more likely to be hired. Uh, and one of the and and that was basically dependent on the past performance. But remember, the past performance is two things: is whether or not you were in the fantasy football last year, uh, and if you were in the fantasy football, the performance uh, that you that you observed last year. So now I split it between uh, players who played last season and for which I've basically uh, used the, uh, the score that they have, their fantasy football score the previous seasons. And here we do find that black players are more likely to be picked, uh, but it's much reduced compared to the initial estimates. Uh, but if we look at the, at the new players, the one for which we have the least information about their productivity, then black players are discriminated. OK, so here basically we are in a world where statistical discrimination is possible because there is far less information about those new players 
and how they are going to adapt to the, fun, to the Premier League. And here we find that black players are discriminated. When information is available about their productivity, then it's no longer the case. Okay? So that sounds consistent with some evidence of statistical discrimination. In the absence of uh, information about productivity, black players are discriminated. When there is information about productivity, that's no longer the case. Um, but still, that leaves us that non-whites are still preferred compared to, uh, to white players when you control for fast productivity, which is still a bit of a puzzle. So, Let's explore that a little bit further and split it by characteristics of the footballer. And the characteristics that I'm going to, to, to use are how expensive is the footballer. So here I'm going to keep basically the, uh, the I change it. So I think the, 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 the left point is the bottom 80% by price. And so are the 20% more expensive. Uh, popularity is the same, uh, so it must be the 10%, sorry, I think it's 10%, not 20 So it's so those are the 10% more expensive, the 10% more popular, and, and international status or not international status. So you, what you see is that basically the black players that are not discriminated are the superstars. Okay, the ones that are very expensive because they are typically uh, very highly productive or, or well known for some other reasons, and the ones that, are, that have been very productive in, in the past season. So for those black footballers, we don't observe any discrimination. In fact, we observe that they are more likely to be picked, in, even in a model controlling for productivity. Okay, so, the, so that strange result that we were getting to start with is mostly driven by the superstars. Okay, so the, the black superstars are not discriminated. Maybe because the cost of discrimination is too high for the those, those guys. Or maybe because their, their performance uh, overcomes any stereotype or any preferences for hiring uh, non black OK. Uh, I don't have so much time, so let's move on to the other decision that you have to make. As I said, there is another three decisions that you have to make, and maybe those are even more important, is to decide who is among those 15 players that you have selected, who are the 11 that are going to actually produce something for your firm. So that's your playing players. Uh, and then your captain is basically the player that you perceive as your best player. Okay, vice captain is your second best. In some sense, we are already less interested in that guy. So, so what happens when we look at those decisions? Basically, on all of those decisions, and whether or not you're controlling for past performance, price, on all of those, on all of those decisions, black players are discriminated. Okay, so. When you look at the marginal players, the ones that are really going to matter for your team, black players are discriminating. Okay. Uh, let's move. Up. And here, uh, yeah, no, so let's move because I, I'm, I only have five minutes left. Uh, let's move to the weekly decisions. Um, Uh, basically, uh, conditional on, on changing your team, people change only one player in their team. So again, it's a marginal decision about changing one player. Okay, uh, that graph shows you that basically a large fraction of participants in the fantasy football stop playing it in the sense that they are not active uh, quite quickly. Uh, so here for the remaining of, the, of looking at those weekly decisions, I want people who are active in the game, otherwise it, it's not very interesting. So I'm going to focus on the 40% of participants that are active in the last four weeks of the season. Okay, and that's the type of model that I'm going to estimate. So again, it's the same decisions of that hiring, making a player play, being the captain, on a bunch of characteristics which I interact with uh, black. And maybe the, the, what I find the more interesting model is a dynamic one where the interaction is basically the, between black and the same indicator at the previous period. So if you were hired in the team at period T minus one, are you still hired in the team at period T? Okay, so do you keep the same players or do you get rid of them? Uh, and here is what we find is that again, doesn't matter what type of controls you are putting, which are the, the three first dots, uh, whether you look at the static model or the dynamic model, um, 
here the, the red line is over there. So the red line for, for zero is uh, almost outside of the graph. Uh, but on basically, uh, here you find again that black players are discriminated. Okay, so, so what I find the most interesting is here in those dynamic models is that basically black players are more like are less likely to be hired in the first week, and then in subsequent weeks are more likely to be fired. Okay, uh, and that's true, uh, and that's even more likely to be true if they are superstars. So the, the superstar blacks are also basically put maybe to under greater scrutiny because they are much more likely also to be sacked. Okay, so maybe it's some attention that is being paid to the to the star performers, and star performers are the one most likely to be swapped, and that affects the black players the most. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so let's look at those things. So basically, then it shouldn't surprise you considering what I just said, that uh, black players are most likely to, to lose their position in the team over the season, what we find is that teams are getting whiter over time. Okay, so here is basically uh, three versions of the same graph with different measures of race. Uh, the black line is basically the racial composition of all the teams um, in week one, from teams that are... Uh, overly white to teams that are overly black and zero is a basically a team that you will have selected as sorry the racial composition of a team that will have been randomly selected okay so you can see that the uh, average participant as a team that is whiter than uh, if picked by if picked randomly and that basically over the season the teams are getting even whiter they move to the left of the distribution and here we have, in the last minute that I have, what are the costs of discriminating? So here we are basically, uh, again, in a setup where one of the advantages is that we can look at the, at the cost of discriminating. So we have the total productivity of all the firms, and we even know what is the production front share of those firms, because every week we can reconstruct what, should have been the, what was the best team to have in that week. Yeah, so the, the dream team to have in that week. Uh, so then you can measure the, uh, the, the distance to that frontier uh, and we basically, uh, and the average efficiency is, is, is only 37%. Okay, so the average person is only, pro is only uh, pro getting 37% of the points that were uh, available in that week. Um, but those who are discriminators, according to basically the deficient definition here, so those that are basically on the left of that uh, one standard deviation, uh, uh, more dis <laughs> sorry, one standard deviation on the left of uh, of a team that was that would have been picked as random. So discriminators are, are forfeiting uh, 0.1 of a standard deviation in in that distance. Okay, so so that that's the additional loss that they are making by by discriminating. I'm aware that I rushed through a lot of things. <laughs> so let's have a concluding slide on the last seconds of the talk. Um, so we find some evidence of, of discrimination in hiring, especially for new black players. So for the one for which there is least information about their productivity. Um, we also find that participants discriminate most for the marginal players, uh, the ones that actually bring points to the team. Uh, and the captain, which is the one that uh, brings the most points, or at least whose productivity is doubled. Uh, so for, on those positions, uh, black players are less likely to be picked. There is discrimination, even if you control for productivity and price. Uh, and there is also discrimination in firing. So at a given level of productivity, a black player is more, more likely to lose his position in the team than a white player. So teams are becoming whiter over time. And that's especially true for superstars, uh, maybe because there is more attention being paid to them. And that's it. OK, well, thank you very much, Arno. Uh, we've got lots of time for uh, questions. Uh, of your uh, very good keeping to time. Uh, Alessandro has his hand up. Yeah, uh, hello. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, thank you for the paper, it was really interesting. 
the first question, do you think that considering uh, fantasy Premier League drafts, because I know that there are like two versions, what is the classic one and the other is the draft where you, uh, when like uh, um, managers take their decision based on uh, others managers in the league because it's like in auction system so we do you think that in this case uh, managers will change their preferences and their like attitude to, to toward discrimination a, at least at the beginning of the of the season once once they have to pick the the first team because uh, i think that in this case it would be really interesting to analyze what happens to discrimination one once people have to interact between each other and uh, condition also on limited availability of choice. I think it will be like more close to reality. And I don't know if you have this data because probably if you uh, play football league, fantasy Premier League draft, it's like private league. So I don't know if you have access to this data, but I think it can be interesting also to put in this pr perspective. And the second question was just, uh, you, you, you said that you also have data on the nationality of the of the managers, uh, but you rely on names. I don't know if like names are like uh, fake names or nicknames, but if, I, if I'm not wrong, uh, you have also access to the flag of the managers. So I think uh, if you want to rely more on like, the national, nationality of the manager, I think you, you can have this information and can be probably more accurate. And because I think it's really important also to, to control for nationality of the managers, because I think I have a lot of in the selection process so this is just my comments okay so yeah we do have the nationality of the managers and that's what we are using um, and then on top of that we are using the name to infer the race of the manager okay uh, but in one of the things that i skipped uh we can look at <laughs> so the so the little squiggle here is basically the decisions of managers based on their uh, location. And you can see that there is a little bit of variation, but not by much. Okay, so basically the discrimination is reasonably similar wherever the managers are claiming to be living around the world. Okay. If you're looking at race, and again, it's only inferred race based on their name, again, there is not a huge amount of variation. There is a few outliers, but that's, so that for the races for which we have few managers and there is a there's a large standard error. So basically, none of those uh, differences are significant. On your first point regarding the draft, um, in in the version of the, at least in the years of the data that we have, there was not such a thing as a draft. Uh, so I don't know whether that's a new, uh, that's a new uh, uh, occurrence or, or not, but, but we, 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 don't have, we don't have such a thing. So in, in the version of, of the game that people were playing, there is, there is no draft. You can uh, you can pick, uh, but in that sense, we think that that's an advantage because it reflects your true taste for a footballer rather than any strategic decision yeah. which is based on preventing others from getting that person. Yeah, this is true. But if you think about the labor market, if I choose like uh, someone to hire, then another employee would not have this uh, option. So I think in that regard, I agree with you. But in that regard, would be like also interesting to see once I have a, a limited option of people that have abilities to, to make like uh, this uh, constraint. Anyway, yeah, yeah, that yeah. probably depends on the type of, uh, of worker research. that you are hiring. Yeah, I mean, okay. in, a, in a lot of cases, employers are not going to be uh, having some uh, strategic consideration when they're hiring. Uh, but again, for superstars, that, that may be the case. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Alessandro. Carl put a question in the chat. He apparently has no camera or microphone today, which is why he's being uh, quiet. Uh, but he says FPL players are choosing teams and footballers uh, on the idea that, well, I think Liverpool are going to do well this weekend, so I'll pick a Liverpool defender. So the racial composition of the rest of the real football team may somewhat plausibly affect uh, FPL recruitment decisions. Discrimination may be at team and football level. You can probably disentangle this using variation in the race of co-workers. So we do know the team for which uh, footballers are playing and we control for that. So uh, if a team is having an easy feature uh, in one given week, um, that, that, will be, that will be captured. Um, 
uh, I think. So that, that shouldn't be too much of an issue. The other thing that we control for is that sometimes because uh, of, the, of the calendar, a team end up having uh, two games in one uh, game week of the, of the fantasy football or no game in one game week of the fantasy football. And we also control for that because that also affects decisions to, to, put, uh, to hire a worker or to put him as a captain if you know that he's going to be playing twice. Uh, or not at all. Yeah. Alex, go on. So, Arno, at, at the end there, you threw in a bit of behavioural economics, didn't you? Um, you talked about the salience of superstars. I'm just trying to think, in what world that Becker was living in, did he possibly ever think that you might exercise your taste for discrimination, particularly in that domain when it was where it was most costly to do so. Well, here I think it's the domain also where there is the most return for doing so. So if you can only change one worker per week cost at, a, at no cost, probably not much of a, of a return of changing one of your bench warmer because that's not going to affect your productivity. So, so the, the one on which you pay attention is going to be your most productive workers and whether you at that price you cannot get another guy uh, who is also a high productive worker. So that, they are the one on which you pay a lot of attention and that's also where we find the action. I think most of the other workers, basically players of, sorry, uh, managers don't spend that much attention on them because they don't bring points anyway or a few points. So they, 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 spend, they put their attention on the few expensive players that you can have in your team. As maybe I, I, I didn't mention that in the, uh, in the talk, but the, uh, the 100 million is, uh, is pretty binding. So you, you cannot hire a lot of superstar for that money. Uh, so I'm, I think with all definition of superstar, maybe uh, teams will have three or four. And, and that will be it. So, so that's going to be the players on which you, you, you focus your attention. And that's, that's kind of consistent with what we find in our, in our results, that most of the results are driven by those expensive players on which these are, pe people are trading them in and out. Okay, we've got a flood of questions uh, came in. And so we go first to Ian. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yep, we can see yep. you, but I can hear you. Okay. Um, maybe I, no. Uh, yeah. So, you, I guess the yeah the best players uh, of this game they treat it like almost like a trading game. They're they're looking out for the the good deals and who's going to improve in value, and then they sell them on. Um, and so I guess amongst that group of like elite players, I suppose it's quite difficult to think where they're discrimination taste would be coming in and coming to play. So I was wondering, because you showed how costly it is for managers to discriminate, but I was wondering, wondering of the managers who do really well, is there evidence of discrimination there? Right. So uh, basically uh, on the, can you still see my slides? Yeah. 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 Um, so that speaks a little bit to what you're saying. So where we see the most, so if you look at uh, basically decisions to, uh, to make, to keep your player, to make the player uh, somebody who is going to, to come for your team or not, uh, here is basically uh, that set is managers who have never played the game before, who have played it for a couple of seasons most, or who have played the most, uh, more than two seasons. Uh, for those who have played it before, uh, did they, uh, did their performance put them in the bottom 10 percent, the between 10 and 90, or the top 10 percent performers? And you can see that those guys are the ones discriminating the least. So the, the best managers yeah. from the past are discriminating the least. The ones that were the worst manager in the past are discriminating the most. Uh, and 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 look, that's basically where most of the variations in managers' uh, behavior is coming from. It's not coming from race. It's not coming from where they come from in the world. It's coming from how good they have been in the past. So the, I think that's that's exactly your intuition: is that the, the best guy know how to play the game, and they know that discriminating is probably not the best thing to do. But still, they, they discriminate a little bit. Okay. Is that with the? I don't know where your data 
ends is that with the Salah era because I think you know everyone's captain Salah now so no that's how uh, to imagine discriminating operating the project is older than that <laughs> so, uh, so I think we had Suarez Suarez, Suarez was Suarez as the, as the outlier um, but I think Su Suarez ended up being dropped out of the sort of results that I present because he's not consistently his race is not consistent over the three measures Perfect. But yeah, there was one elite player that also something that I uh, uh, I looked at is basically the distribution of players picked over the season. And you can see that over the season, the teams converge to some kind of elite player. So in, in Oreo, Suarez was the one that everybody was picking and picking as a captain because he was kind of scoring the most and scoring very consistently. Great, thanks. Ian, next we've got Stefan. Or it could be thanks, uh, uh, it's very it's a very interesting um, paper. Um, so my question, this this question um, may not be relevant. If, it depends on whether I really understand what's going on, which so it may not be a relevant question if I've got this wrong. But if I'm right, would it be right to say that if a player is not selected to play by the real manager in the real world, then the player will, in the fantasy game, will attract zero points for that week. So that's there right. is, that's right. So then, it, so then this is not necessarily purely taste-based discrimination. If I think the real world manager has, is racially prejudiced in some way, then I may choose not to select a black player because I think their chances of playing and therefore are not playing and therefore attracting zero points is actually higher than it is for the average white player. And that would seem to be consistent with your result that the new black players are the ones that are most likely, the ones without prior Premier League experience, the ones that are most likely not to get selected unlike the experienced black players who perhaps are less likely to face this kind of prejudice. Right, so, you, so you're correct. If the, uh, if the, manager, the real managers of the, of the real footballers are discriminating, uh, then uh, fantasy football managers should be less likely to pick black workers. Um, but remember, we also control for the productivity of those workers. So here we are going to compare two... Uh, footballers who have the same level of productivity, so they, they are picked by their real life manager as often as, as the other one. Uh, still, there is going to be some differences in how often they are picked by a fantasy football manager. But we also, Arno, we also tested for that um, discrimination in the real world with our data and found that minutes played on the pitch over our season did not differ by the race of players in the real world. That's right. I didn't show that today, but yeah. So, so, so in fact, it doesn't happen in the real world, although that doesn't address Stefan's point that people might think it might happen in the real world. So the other question I had was, um, how does this relate to um, a cheeky question, Bryson and Chevalier, uh, 2015? Who, 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 and I quote, say, no evidence of racial discrimination in hiring at the onset and throughout the season. We were wrong. <laughs> so you're so, withdrawing that paper from Labour Economics gosh. now. That's, that's, that's cancelled, is it? So the, the, so the data, even though it's both fantasy football leagues, the, uh, the unit of observation is quite different. So in that first paper, we were looking at the, the footballer was a unit of observation. And, and all we had was a number of fantasy football participants who had picked that, that, uh, that real footballer and how much that varied over the season, depending on, on the performance of, of that player. Uh, whether here what we, what we are using is, is uh, individual decisions from, uh, from, uh, from uh, team managers to, uh, to hire a given worker. Uh, and in fact, we have, uh, 
if we re-aggregate the data that we have now, we've managed to, um, to reproduce the results that we did in that labor economics papers previously. So, so the fact that basically they are not exactly measuring the same thing is, is the reasons why we also find different results. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the other thing that could also uh, explain it is that the effect that we are observing in, in that data that I present now um, are pretty small. Uh, because the probability that, I mean, there are 670 footballers and you only pick 15 of them. So each footballer has what a probability of something like 2% to be picked. Um, uh, so even the, so I, I'm now forgetting what I wanted to say <laughs> exactly. Um, so let's, let's forget about that, sorry. <laughs> Uh, if that comes back to me, I, I, will, I will answer your questions with, with what I wanted to say there, but it kind of eludes me now. <laughs> okay, thanks, Stefan. We've got Hendrik next. Yeah, uh, hi, Arno. Um, hi. Thanks, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I was thinking about how this uh, friend of the football players makes their decisions and uh, of course, there are the statistic guys studying uh, performance and so on, but there could also be um, a substantial part of people um, following um, other kinds of heuristics like, uh, I know the name, so I take the guy. So I was wondering um, whether it makes sense to include some measure of uh, media appearance, like Instagram followers, Google search, hits. I mean, it, it, uh, it correlates with performance, but there are ways to uh, separate this, like using the residuals of a regression that explains uh, media at, um, appearance with uh, performance. So this is my question, what do, what do you think about this? Okay, okay. so no, that's a very good point. Um, we tried to pick, that, pick up a bit of that by uh, controlling for international status, thinking that, okay, if you've played for your national team, you must be a little bit more famous than somebody who hasn't. Um, but that's kind of a, that's the crude measure that we have that we have used, uh, and indeed there's a, there's some variation there in the in the, in the results by by international status. Uh, we could we could consider looking at those things. Things that our data is a, is a few years I have to go back a few few years now. So maybe there was less. So. Maybe that's good because there was less social media. <laughs> uh, but if we want to collect data from a uh, source few years ago, that's going to be pretty tricky. Uh, but maybe we should think, yeah, I mean, count in, in newspapers is definitely doable. Uh, so maybe that's something we, we, could, we could look at, especially if you look at the non-sport section. <laughs> But, but you do have popularity. I mean, you talked about pop you, we see other people's picks, yeah? Yep. And that's the Adler definition of superstar, if I remember correctly. Popularity. That's, and yeah, and I, like I think that's a good device in this setting. You know, what do other guys do? And, and one thing that Arno was going to be looking at at some point was the networks within the mini leagues. You know, in the mini leagues, I know what Arno chose last week. Do you converge or do you diverge or that sort of thing? Yeah, so that's uh, that's a bit about competition that I alluded at the beginning, but at the moment uh, we don't have the results yet. <laughs> uh, but yes, it's exploiting the exploiting those mini leagues. So who are you competing with? How far are you from the guy above you and below you in the mini league, and how that affects uh, your behavior? Would be the kind of question that we're also interested in. Okay. Thanks, Hendrik. And then we've got Craig with a question. My question is involving tastes that exist outside of race because this is sports, these are fans playing. And some of these other tastes might be correlated with race. So, for example, I actually played this game a few years ago when they, when they started uh, showing Premier League games in the United States with my friends. And we used it as a way to learn about the league. And then, so obviously, we wanted to win, but we were having fun as well. And so we're going to choose all the American players, which are few in the Premier League. And so our taste might have been to choose American players, which at the time I believe were all white. So in your data, would we come across as being, you know, having taste for white players when in reality our taste was for our own national, our own national players? Right. So uh, when uh, so in some of those specifications, I, I control for the uh, 
country of origin of the football manager. So somebody playing like you only pick up Americans because he's American, that, that would have been picked by, by those dummies. So conditional on being American. Sorry, go ahead. But then the interpretation would still be a uh, taste for racial, racial preferences, right? And, but it would really be the uh, kind of random event that the, the national players happen to be white. It's not that we were choosing white players, but the interpretation would still be that it's evidence of racial discrimination. Is that correct? Um, yes, I guess so. Um, so yeah, even yeah, so if even you're controlling for, for some, I wonder if you could do some kind of conditional logic, conditional probit, or some kind of interaction to to tease out some of that. Because I'm thinking, you know, what are what are the distribution of the the players of the fantasy league? Is that is that likely to happen? And then there's also, you know, it might be more random, but then there's also I think players are more likely to choose players from their favorite team, right? But that might be more random and not as correlated with race, but it depends on the player. Right. So uh, we do have information about their favorite team, uh, which I think at the moment we are not using. Uh, yeah, but they're only allowed to choose up to three from their favorite team. Yeah, that's a rule, a uh, fancy football rule. Exactly. So while you can pick 11 or 15 Americans, you can only pick three guys from Leeds. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Craig. Alex? Yeah, one thing I think that's really important for us to think about was the, the slide at the end or near the end, which was which was the price of discrimination. Uh, and, and you had it expressed in terms of standard deviations. And I was just wondering, it, how big is that relative? Because my recollection was that these black and white players are largely substitutes for one another. So, yes. Um, and therefore, originally, we used to think, oh, my God, there is this discrimination, but it doesn't matter anyway, because all these players are as good as one another. So now you've got something a bit different. Um, exactly. So that's a bit where I don't have time to finish. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I've left it at point one of a standard deviation, and uh, I wanted to try to tease out how large of an effect that was in terms of points so that we get maybe a, a better idea whether it's large or not. And, you know, in terms of rank in the overall league, how much that will make you jump. Uh, so that's kind of what I want to do, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> but, yes, I don't know. Do you have other ideas of how we could uh, speak about the importance of that loss? I think the, 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 the ranking is kind of, uh, so the, the actual number of points and the ranking, how much of a difference it will make over the season is kind of the obvious matrix, but happy, happy to hear all the solutions. No, we know in the real world that it'll be about whether you avoid, you know, the how much difference it makes to avoiding relegation and so on, but of course there isn't such a thing here. So it's just about where you are in the rank order of uh, of the competition. Yeah. Great, thanks, Alex. Um, just uh, Anthony's put a question in the chat before we go to Sebastian. Uh, Anthony says, can the games developers encourage participants to discriminate by setting lower, lower wages on certain players? I didn't get that, sorry, can you say that again? Can the games developers encourage participants to discriminate by setting lower wages, I guess, uh, their fees are on certain players. Yeah, right. So that's kind of uh, what we checked at the beginning, uh, that the prices were uh, similar. Uh, where is that uh, weekly price? So here, the, the top right corner here yeah. uh, is a different, it's a distribution of the, of the, of the cost of hiring a, uh, a footballer uh, by race. Um, there's not much of a there's not much of a difference. As I said, it's maybe a, a little bit for the cheap uh, uh, workers <laughs> that uh, there's a there's a few uh, a few more cheap white guys and a few more than than black guys. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, but when we look at the evolution, do we have it? Uh, the evolution of price over time by point. Uh, Okay, so here, if you basically, it will only matter if um, ah, we don't. 
uh, no, we don't see it from there. Uh, whether the uh, basically uh, the, an underpricing of, of performance of, of black uh, players uh, and changing over time. But, uh, I don't have that graph here, but yeah, we, we don't find evidence of it. Okay. Sebastian. So uh, thanks, Anna, for the very interesting presentation. Um, we have uh, actually a similar, or we're working on a similar project uh, for Germany, so it would be great to have a discussion with you guys um, at some point. Um, my question is uh, regarding the modeling, how you uh, model the uh, hiring decision. I think you you said you model it uh, in a um, in a Duyard sample, so that would mean you model it as a kind of an independent decision, right? And what I'm thinking about is with that are you not creating maybe a kind of a mechanical effect so thinking about i mean the decision of hiring a person is not independent of the other ones right because you can only hire 50. so if i have for example a sample which with much more white players which you which you don't have but in case then you would automatically create for some of the white players a non-hiring decision right so um my question is, how, how do you think about that? Do you think that could be a problem, modeling it as an independent decision? Uh, yes, we yeah. did worry a bit about that. <laughs> we, we just can't figure out uh, how it could be done uh, yeah. differently. <laughs> um, yeah. As you said, uh, you, you make a decision based on your uh, price, so, so your budget constraint. <laughs> And you have to hire. You have 15 slots to fill. Uh, so of course, if you hire a super expensive player to start with, or at one of those 15 is super expensive, that puts some constraint on the on the on the others that you are hiring because now you have to also buy some cheap players uh, in order to compensate. Um, but but that is actually not my main worry. My worry is think about you have a sample of 100 players, right? And you have maybe 90 white players and 10 black players and you are hiring 15 players, then a huge amount of the white players will get a non-hiring decision. So zero outcome, meaning they are discriminated, but just because you can only hiring uh, maybe 14 white uh, players have one black player, um, but that is for the black player, the probability is one out of 10, and for the uh, white players, the probability is 14 out of 85. So you don't have that extreme case, but I, I'm, I haven't really figured out a solution for it, but it would be maybe interesting to think a little bit about, about that. So luckily you don't have these extreme examples, but, but I'm struggling a little bit with the modeling and saying, okay, it's an independent decision. Yep, no, no, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's a fair point. It's a bit like a, the idea of a, a common support idea about productivity dispersion by black and white within position in the team. I think so you have to fill not just 15 slots but subsets of slots for defense attack and midfield goalie is a problem <laughs> the common support by race is not there but you I think you need this idea of common support by race and productivity just in other words there needs to be a counterfactual player of another race and that is an issue that is an ish issue that we should think about I think but we uh, yeah so among the millions of graphs that we have produced, we also have those productivity, productivity graph by position. Uh, and again, we can see that uh, for all positions, there is an overlap of productivity between black and white. Goalies being the, the exception, because as I said, there was only one black or non-white uh, goalkeeper in, in that season. Uh, so here, basically, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's almost impossible not to discriminate. Uh, just because there's a lack of choice. But for every other position, it's, you can always find a substitute. Thanks, but super interesting, thanks. Great, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Arno and Alex. We've hit four o'clock, so we will wrap things up for this week. Uh, thank you uh, for a really, really interesting talk. Uh, and um, that with, with that, we wrap up for Easter. Uh, so next week is Good Friday, so we won't be having a talk next week. The following week, uh, I'll be on holiday, so there won't be a talk. The following week, we'll return on the 29th of April, uh, and I will circulate details about it. And we have Michael Lechner 
uh, talking, uh, uh, speaking that week, and I've put in the uh, chat the title, uh, which is the effect of sport in online dating evidence from causal machine learning. So that was like a particularly interesting talk uh, for us to return with on the 29th of April. So have a great Easter, everybody, and I look forward to seeing you again after Easter. Okay, and thanks for having me around and for all your questions. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>